How's that working? Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Women Empowerment Shattering Session. Today, we'll be having a pediatric dentistry session with Dr. Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for joining us today. Whenever you feel ready, please begin your presentation. My pleasure. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to figure out because um, I'm also doing a live on mine. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let me just put everything up so we can set up. Thank you guys so much for having me today. Um, I'm so excited to just share a little bit about my life and um, encourage anyone who's out there who wants to become a pediatric dentist that you guys can do it. And I just kind of want to show you the struggles that I went through um, so that you can see, hey, this is totally doable. You just have to be committed and have to stay focused. Um, if there are questions, are we just going to answer those at the end? Yes, we will. Okay. Um, sounds great. And then uh, feel free to like stop me if um, you guys have any questions as I go along, um, because I can't really see any, any of the questions. So I don't mind if it's more of like a little dialogue, if you guys don't mind. Sounds good. So just get started. Hello. Yep. Okay, okay. So hi, everybody. My name is um, Dr. Jennifer Vialta. I'm a pediatric dentist based out of Los Angeles, California. Um, I was asked to speak to you guys just a little bit about my, um, my journey, how I became a pediatric dentist, um, the kind of things that I do every day for um, in pediatric dentistry with my, my patients and their families, um, and then just answering any questions that you guys may have about the field. And bear with me, I've never done the screen sharing. How do I, oh, there we go. So our agenda for today will be um, to focus on what is a pediatric dental specialist, um, a typical day in my life. So kind of like some of the procedures I do, sedations, um, some of the instruments that I use, diagnostic tests, um, complaints that I hear a lot from patients. So kind of like what you would be seeing every day as a pediatric dentist. Um, when patients and their families come into your office. Um, the timeline to becoming a pediatric dentist, mine was a little bit different. So I'll kind of share with you how um, my timeline was compared to most people's timelines. Um, I'll share with you why my timeline was a little bit longer than most um, because I had a lot of failures, but a lot of successes came from that. Um, advice that I have for anyone who's in college right now, um, who's interested in dentistry, who is in, res who is in uh, dental school right now and would like to um, become a resident. I'm going to try and share as much as I can today with you guys about that. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about dental terminology, just so you guys can kind of see um, or hear some of the terminology that we use every day, and then advice for future dentists. And okay, so hi again, my name is Dr. Jen. I'm a pediatric dentist from uh, Los Angeles. I also have my master's in public health, both of which I received simultaneously at UCLA um, when I was a resident. Um, my MPH I got actually during the weekends, which was the only way that um, I could get it at the same time without having to add an extra year of um, schooling. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we would spend about 10 to 12 hours just kind of sitting, getting lectured, um, learning about uh, public health and what that means both within our own little world and also uh, worldwide and the different implications, the different things that um, we can choose to do in healthcare one day and how that can uh, affect people um, on a grander scale. I received my doctorate of dental surgery from University of Pacific Dental School, best dental school ever. 100% um, would recommend anyone to go there. It's the only three-year institution uh, dental school in the country. So I already knew that I wanted to specialize in pediatrics. It's something that I've been doing since I was in high school. So I, I knew that I wanted to cut off as much time from the journey as possible. Um, but not only that, the, um, UOP is just such an amazing school that fosters your growth. Um, they're nice to you, which is not something that's very common in a lot of dental schools. Um, they have a very holistic approach as to how they teach and how they um, foster and mentor you throughout your journey in dental school. Um, I received my bachelor's of science from UCLA uh, and that was in, I graduated in 2012. Um, before that, I went to community college for about five years because I was working full time to kind of get myself um, to, to 
be able to get all these degrees. Um, so I was working full time and I could only take one to two classes a day, um, one to two classes classes a semester because, you know, for science classes, they're, they're pretty tough um, to be able to take more than one or two, especially if you're only going at nighttime and you don't have that much time to spend studying, you know, two classes was enough for me. A um, little bit more about my journey. Uh, so I, one big thing that I always like to start off with is I dropped out of high school. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and it's one of those things that you kind of have to be super self-aware in yourself and know that when people tell you, you can't do something, you know, you just need to not listen to that and just stay focused on, on what your, um, goals are. So like I was saying, I went to the JC for five years. I transferred to UCLA, um, to get my bachelor's in science and physiological sciences. And um, during my last year at UCLA, I was just burnt out. I didn't, I was working two jobs. I was playing rugby. Um, I was in physiological sciences, which is one of the hardest majors at UCLA. I was competing with all these amazing kids who had been at UCLA already for three years going on their senior year. They already kind of, you know, had bonds with each other. They had study groups with each other. They knew the teachers and I was just kind of like, I felt lost and overwhelmed. Um, so I decided, you know what, I'm not going to stress out about this. I'm going to use this time to learn more about myself and do some Thing that I've always wanted to do. So I took a gap year. Um, during my gap year, if you guys look at that bottom right picture, um, the first thing that I did was I embarked on uh, this mission called Pacific Partnership. And it was a military mission with the Navy. Um, I, while I was a uh, assisting as a dental assistant, one of the doctors that I was helping, he had told me he was in the military and that he remembered civilians being on board for one of these missions. So I Googled, I emailed everybody I could, and I finally heard back. I got onto um, this military mission trip and I was able to um, provide care for countries, some countries that I'd never even heard of, like Marshall Islands, I'd never even heard of that place. So I was able to go to 13 countries. Um, some of that time I kind of backpacked on my own. Some of that time I was with the military. Um, some of that time I met friends that were around the world. So I really got to know myself. I got to really hone in, you know, what is it that I want to do being a pediatric dentist? Um, because for me, I'm very goal oriented and everything has to have a purpose for me for me to be able to continue working towards that. So um, I just, I saw that there wasn't a huge difference between how much uh, children are underserved here in our own country compared to children abroad. And so I wanted to be able to be in a field that I could give back to my own community, the communities where I came from, you know, I don't remember going to Dennis. My mom says we went, but I don't remember that. Um, so who knows if we went and I want to make sure that the kids out there that need the most help see people like me that you know they can emulate and they, they can see in themselves hey if she could be a doctor I can be a doctor um, so that's kind of where my journey took me um, this picture on the top right is when I was presenting my research um, during my second year my last year of residency which is kind of something huge for me. I never thought I would research anything, much less get published. Um, so it really, my time at UCLA was really instrumental in helping me grow um, into the clinician I am today. Uh, next one. So my timeline to um, becoming a pediatric dentist was a little bit different. Most people go into it straight out of high school. You go and you get your bachelor's. Um, most of the time they want you to have a science bachelor's, but honestly, um, it doesn't matter. It, I, I think it actually looks good if you want to major in something different. Um, because it just shows that you are creative, you have different interests that you can also bring into the field and help make it better. Um, the only thing is that if you do major in something different, you still have to have the same prerequisites as um, a science major to um, receive admittance into a dental school. So you have to take the biologies, you have to take the chemistries, organic chemistries, um, the physics, the... Uh, I don't know, do you have to take statistics? You may have to take statistics. So I would just make sure that 
all the schools that you're looking into applying, all the dental schools, that you know what their requirements are and that you have those requirements. Um, so that way you're not wasting your time and your money um, and your energy, you know, applying to a school that maybe won't even look at your application. Um, but I do know that some of my friends who um, went into dental school didn't have all of the prerequisites and the schools were fine with it. I don't know if that's something that's you know, one in a million, or if that happens a lot. So if you guys want to chime in, um, but usually, yeah, they want you to have certain prereqs done. I majored in physiological sciences. So physiological sciences is kind of like a beautiful merger of um, science and our body, our physical body, the world, and kind of how it works together from the micro cellular level all the way to the macro full body level. So it's kind of like, I'm a huge nerd and I just, I like to know how things um, work together. And so that for me was perfect. Um, I also looked into going um, into sports science, um, neurodevelopmental science, but physiological sciences was honestly like, I, it's my favorite major. Um, and I'm so glad that I took it. Uh, let's see. So dental school, like I was saying, usually dental school is um, four years for most most uh, dental schools. UOP is the only three year institution in the US. So it's definitely worth um, taking a look at. The campus is brand new. It's beautiful. It's in um, downtown San Francisco. So it's all glass. Um, like I said, they just, they treat you like a doctor from day one, you know, they want you, um, you we don't wear scrubs to school, we wear uh, professional attire because they want you to take on that persona of, hey, I am now going to be a provider for my patients and that starts from day one um, and that's how they treat you. So for me, it's very important to be in an environment where I'm fostered and um, UOP was 100% that and it still continues to be that school for me. Um, so I would definitely recommend looking into dental school there. Um, if not, there are other amazing dental schools. Um, so usually, like I said, three or four years. And then pediatric dental residency was uh, two years for me. Some people's are a year longer. A lot of times they do that if you want to get a master's. So um, I have some friends who went to UCSF. They have an extra year so that you can complete your master's, which honestly is pretty cool if you're trying to focus on research and um, really having those three years to create a research topic, research it, um, working with faculty and then getting it published. It's something that, you know, everyone thinks is super easy. Research is not easy, um, but it's super fulfilling when you can come up with a hypothesis of something and then come up with um, answers that can contribute to hopefully that hypothesis, creating something for our patients that can make their health better. Uh, so what is a pediatric dentist? What do I do every single day? So I think one of the big things is that we monitor um, growth and development, and that comes in so many different areas. So that's one of the big reasons why I love pediatric dentistry. It's like a huge puzzle. Um, it's not the same every single day. It changes constantly. Um, you can have a three-year-old once in one room and a three-year-old in another room, and they have completely different um, needs. They have different families. Um, they have different numbers of families that they kind of live between. Um, they have different behaviors. They have um, different medical issues. They have different dental history backgrounds. So we have to take into account all of those things before we create a treatment plan for the patient, because what's What's good for one patient isn't necessarily good for another patient. Um, growth and development is huge. I think as a pediatric dentist, we collaborate really closely with orthodontists, which are um, the masters of having everything fit together like a puzzle piece in your mouth. Um, they, they're the ones who do your braces for you. Um, so I love, and I'm so lucky I get to work with one of my best friends. Uh, we actually went to dental school together. And so bouncing off ideas about um, different craniofacial development patterns that we see in kids and, you know, recommending, hey, is it a good idea to start an expander now so that later on you can prevent this child from having asymmetric um, craniofacial growth. So sometimes uh, some can, kids can present with cross bites, which is where um, your bottom teeth are either like this, this is an anterior cross bite, or like this, 
posterior cross bite. And so as um, the face develops, if you have those abnormalities, those asymmetries and how everything comes together, it actually creates a shift in how um, things develop. So for example, if you have a posterior crossbite here, your mandible doesn't grow correctly on this side. And so later on, that child will have an asymmetric um, chin, which the only way to correct that later on in adulthood is surgery. But with a child, you can correct that with a simple expander, which is just a little thing that you open up. So um, things like that, I do a lot. Um, I participate in sedations. I um, do. I use nitrous on all of my patients pretty much when we're doing um, treatment. You know, if they need it, usually the the older ones don't need it too much um, unless you have like a really phobic patient. It just kind of helps calm them down. Um, another thing that I do on very select cases is oral conscious sedation, which is where um, you provide the child with some sort of medication that I, I tell the parents, it's as if me or you had a few drinks. Um, it just kind of helps them get through procedures that may be a little more intensive. So like extractions, um, getting like one side of treatment done, um, kids that just need a little bit more help, you know, maybe they, they've had really bad experiences with an, another um, dentist and now they're super phobic. So it just kind of helps get them over that. Um, we work a lot in multidisciplinary teams. So I'm always calling um, TMJ specialists for my teens who have issues or pain in their joints, um, periodontists who are the gum specialists. Again, there's a lot of teens who just don't take care of their teeth and sometimes they, they need that um, extra help from the specialist. Um, oral surgery, we talk to a lot, referring for extractions of wisdom teeth, things like that. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. And then we're also a social worker. Um, a lot of my my um, families, you know, the kids aren't living in one house and it's not just one person taking care of the kids, it's grandma takes care of the kids or they go to um, daycare during the day or they have two um, homes. So you have to take that into account when you're um, providing information for them because just because you tell them to do something, it doesn't mean that they are able to do that, especially when there's two homes. Um, so yeah, we don't just treat the patients, we treat the families. Uh, a lot of times the hardest part of my job is actually the family. The kids are usually super easy, um, but it's just those dynamics and putting everything together. Um, it's as if I have two or three patients in the room at one time, as opposed to just the one patient, because I have to take into account, you know, if I'm doing treatment, like the mom's over there, she's crying, um, the kid's crying, you know, how do I deal with both of these patients at the same time so that they both have a really good experience. So I find that really fun. Um, I think it's awesome when, you know, the mom's crying, the kid's laughing, having a great time, and then the appointment's done and she's like, that's it. Um, so that's one of my biggest wins every day. Uh, typical day for myself would be um, restorative treatments. So usually I'll have uh, dental treatment that I have to provide for children. Um, so our schedule, I should have put a picture of that, sorry. But our schedule is broken up into columns. So each column um, are different things, different treatments that we provide. So in my first column, it would be usually all of my treatments. So if I have to do extractions, if I have to do um, fillings, baby root canals, crowns, that's all gonna go in my first column. And usually each patient I provide about an hour for. Um, I do exams in the other two columns. So exa comprehensive exams for um, kids who are usually from one to 21 year olds. Um, older if they're special needs. Uh, I do nutritional counseling. So I, I have a, sh a form that I have every family fill out just kind of so I can understand, you know, what are your snacking habits like? How often are you eating? What are you eating? Um, are, you, are you having a well-balanced sort of uh, nutrition or are you just kind of sticking to Cheetos? Uh, because that way I can kind of hone in to what each patient and each family needs to hear. Um, Cause I can ramble on for days. I can teach people as if we're in dental school, but I just don't have the time to do that. So I have to make sure that I cater um, everything to each patient. Um, oral hygiene instructions, I, I do a lot because I feel like if patients are empowered, especially the little kids, um, if they're excited to make sure they don't have sugar poop in their mouth, um, they're gonna be the ones telling mom and dad, hey, I need to floss tonight. And so that way you kind of shift 
um, and you empower the children so that they remind the, the parents because parents just have way too much going on. So um, I love oral hygiene instructions. I find it, it amazing when my patients come in the next day, the next um, appointment, and I can see their gums aren't bleeding. I can see, you know, how proud they are that they've been flossing every day and brushing twice a day and using fluoride toothpaste. Um, that is really important. Another thing that I do a lot is helping parents, especially the little ones who don't want to brush and don't want to floss, um, helping them position. I I try and make as many videos as possible and I post them for parents because again you know, I have so many patients I have to see during the day and I want to spend all the time helping them, but sometimes we just don't have time for that. So social media has been awesome in that sense. Uh, sedations, like I said, nitrous, oral conscious sedation. Um, sometimes we do full mouth dental rehabilitations under IVGA, which is um, intravenous general anesthesia. So basically they go to sleep um, for a little bit and then we do all the dental treatment that they need. So that way we... Um, prevent them from having psychological traumas later on uh, about the dentist. Cause that's never, never something that I like seeing breaks my heart. Um, so this is our usual setup for a restorative patient. So I'll usually, I'll always have my x-rays up as you can see on the left-hand side. Um, I like to see what I'm doing and kind of have an overview of what, what this looks like radiographically for the patient. Um, we have our lead apron over there on the right, which if we have to take additional x-rays, we can in the rooms. Um, on that little arm, you can see the instruments that we use. Um, we use slow and we use uh, fast hand pieces to help remove um, infected tissues. We use an air water syringe, which um, when you push the little buttons, it spits out air or water um, for the different things that we need. Um, the little jelly in the mirror there is the topical anesthetic, which we place on the tissues um, before we give uh, local anesthetic injections. Um, and then I like to have all, all the different burrs that I may need, my bite block, everything ready to go. So that way um, I don't have to leave the room because with kids, if, if they start crying, then you know you have five minutes to complete your treatment or less sometimes um, because they can, they can get over it super fast. Um, ah, it's not letting me go forward. There we go. Uh, this is another part of our operatory setup. So in the front is where um, the patient sits and then all of my stuff. And then behind me is where um, all the other uh, armamentarium instruments, cements, um, pulp treatment stuff, filling material, everything is in the back. Um, I'm really big on just being ready for anything. Cause like I said, with kids, you never know if you're going to be able to do the perfect treatment or if you're going to have to do something that's kind of more temporary and then just replace in the future when they get a little bit older and can, can uh, sit in the chair a little bit better. Uh, so that's kind of like our setup for that. Um, some of the biggest things that uh, patients come in complaining about are cavitations. So cavitations are holes in the teeth, basically. And uh, one of the reasons that that could really affect them is um, when you get food stuck in those big holes, that can actually create pain because, you know, there's pressure, it's stuck between um, the tooth and the gums, and it just, it feels like a toothache, like a regular toothache, um, toothache, not toothache. Uh, I had a patient the other day who came in with tooth pain and then um, as you pushed on the gums, all this pus started coming out. He had a little kernel of popcorn stuck in there. So make sure you floss you guys. Um, another reason it could bother them is because they have exposed dentinal tissue, which has nerve endings in it. And so anything really caught, really cold, um, really sugary can ignite that pain. Um, do I always use a rubber dam? Someone was asking. No, I don't. I'm I'm pretty so I'm pretty selective in where what I use when. Um, if I can use an isolite or a dry shield, which is um, this contraption that you put inside of your mouth that suctions for you, it also holds the tongue apart and it also acts as a bite block to open the patient. Um, I prefer to use that if possible. Some really, really little kids can't use them. Um, some kids who have really large gag reflexes can't use them. So I usually like to use that. If I'm doing pulp treatments, um, I will use rubber dams. Um, if the patient can't accept the dry shield, then I'll, I'll use a rubber dam. Um, 
So yeah, it just kind of depends on, on the patient and what they need. Uh, another reason why patients come in is trauma, especially right now with um, COVID last year, kids were going crazy. I was going crazy. Um, so a lot of like falls, a lot of jumping around, a lot of like little brother went like this and knocked out his tooth. Um, so a lot of broken, uh, broken teeth, uh, teeth that have been avulsed, teeth, teeth that have been luxated that, um, you have to take out just because they're so mobile that they, they just, they hurt the patient. And, um, it's just not, uh, ideal to leave it in. And then another thing that comes up a lot, especially for patients who have been deferring treatment is facial swelling. So you can see this is actually one of my little patients who um, came in super swollen. She, she could barely like open her eye. Um, those infections can travel really quickly and go to places that we don't want them to be. The brain, the heart, um, they can compromise airway. So it's really important to get these things taken care of before they become big issues like this, because then uh, my local anesthetic doesn't work as well. They're going to feel a lot more sensitivity. Um, and they're just, they're more uncomfortable and they're, they're less able to handle the procedure. So it's better to do it before it turns into something huge. This is a case that I did um, during general anesthesia. So on the right hand side, I don't think I can play this. On the right hand side, you can see um, that's my anesthesiologist and this patient um, was under general anesthesia. They are intubating this patient um, so that way we can have control of the airway as we're doing surgical treatments. We don't have to worry as much about using water um, because this is a lot safer um, to do it under general anesthesia. Uh, this case, this picture is the before. You could see there's like holes on um, the top front teeth, the maxillary incisors. Those are infections. Those are cavities. Those are holes in diseased teeth um, that need to be taken care of or else, like I was showing you guys earlier, it can turn into an abscess um, and then really bother the patient. And in those cases, we just have to pull out the teeth. But in this situation, I was able to save these teeth, which was really cool. Um, it was one of the biggest things, the, the biggest concerns for the, the, um, the family. So you can see here, um, I am using rubber dam in this one because I don't, for these sort of anterior um, strip crowns, I need to have everything as isolated as possible, no blood, no saliva, so that the restorations hopefully last until the teeth fall out when this patient is around the age of seven to eight. Um, so we use rubber dams and we ligate. Um, I initially start ligating with um, these little kind of like rubber band things in between the teeth. And then um, once everything's nice and situated, we remove all of the diseased tissue. And then with those little plastic covers, if you could see on the right, um, we use that as kind of our framework to be able to restore the teeth with composite fillings. And um, this is the before and afters. I thought it turned out pretty good. Of course, every time you look at your cases, you're like, oh, I could have done this better. I could have done that better. Um, but the parents were super happy. Patient was super happy because they were starting to, to realize, you know, from people making fun of them, of their teeth, that something was wrong with their teeth. So he was super happy um, when he came back. This is another case that I had. Um, the, these two teeth are two baby teeth on the bottom right hand side, baby molars. And you can see before on the left hand, the diseased tooth structure, there's tons of food in there, diseased tooth structure, you remove that. And then on the right is kind of what you're left with. Um, and then after that, you kind of have to remake the tooth. So that's what um, one of the things that as dentists were able to merge science and art. Um, you know, we get to remake teeth when they are broken down, which I think is super cool because a lot of us are pretty artistic who are in dentistry. Um, this is a case that I had when I was in residency, one of the saddest cases I've ever seen. Um, this little baby, he's two years old, he was laying on the ground and his dog um, bit him on the face. And so um, my co-resident and I were on call and we got called probably around three and um, the child wasn't ready. The child went into surgery. Um, they weren't ready for us to start our treatment until I want to say like 10 o'clock at night. Um, so that was a long night. We ended up having to remove um, some teeth because the dog bite kind of fractured this area right here. And um, you don't want to leave teeth that are 
kind of moving around. So we removed a tooth and then um, the right hand side was when he came in for his post-op check a few weeks later, he looked really good. Um, so that's some, some of the stuff that we get to do as pediatric dentists. It's not um, just that we clean teeth, you know, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, these are some of the uh, diagnostic instruments that I use on a regular basis. This is a panoramic radiograph. Um, what we use panoramic radiographs for usually is to get kind of like a good uh, big picture view of what's going on. And you can also see a lot of structures that you don't see when you take um, the x-rays where you just kind of like bite down. Uh, orthodontists use this a lot. We use this a lot to monitor growth and development. So to make sure that we have all of the um, permanent teeth that we should have, all of the baby teeth that we should have, and if there's any sort of abnormalities. So in this panoramic radiograph, if you look right in the middle towards the top, you can see a tooth that just looks like it's, you know, taking a nap. Um, so that's, that's one of, that's a permanent tooth that totally grew in the wrong positioning. Um, unfortunately, this, when I took this picture was the first time that this patient has ever been told um, of this situation. So again, it's something that if you catch it early, it ends up being so much easier to treat than if you wait until way later. So that's why um, these panoramic radiographs are great diagnostic tools for us to be able to help patients. Uh, here's another picture of x-rays. These are bite wing x-rays. Um, and you can see uh, this family opted to not do any treatment when they came in during the foot first deployment, which is the picture on the left. Um, all the darkness that you can see in the teeth, uh, that's those are usually cavities from just loss of tooth structure. So it looks denser in the radiograph. Um, and then you can see the actual intraoral picture where it doesn't show that there's a cavitation, there's no hole. You know, I think this was not even six months later. They came in um, with a chief concern, of course, of pain on the bottom right hand side because they had waited so long to treat this tooth. Um, now their treatment is probably going to be a little bit more invasive. Um, now that the child is in pain, it's probably going to be a little bit more uncomfortable. Um, but you can see the diagnostic tools are really important to be able to show us how disease progresses and to also show parents like, hey, this is what's going on. So just, um, I think it's really important to show this to patients and to parents so that they can understand what we're seeing. Um, I know some dentists don't agree with that, but I think education is really important uh, for the parents to understand what's going on and for case acceptance. Um, they'll accept your treatment a lot easier if you explain it to them, if you show it to them um, so that the, you can, so that they can see that, you know, you, you just care about their, their baby and you just want to help them. A uh, little bit of advice that I have for you guys, if you're on this journey to either going to dental school or going into residency, whatever residency that may be, I think it should be pediatrics, but I'm biased, um, is just making a plan. Um, I think there's something super powerful about writing things down, being able to see, um, being able to manifest like, hey, this is what I want. And then also making a plan for how am I going to get there? Um, because we can all have all these great ideas, but if you don't make like an active plan where like every day you're working towards that, it's going to take you forever and it's going to be super overwhelming and you may not even get there. So I, I want you all to just make a plan. Um, if you're in the, if you're in a community college, make a plan of how I'm going to transfer. If you already transferred or you're at um, a UC, make a plan of like, how am I going to apply to dental school? Like, what do I need to do? What schools do I want to go to? Um, what classes do I have to take? Because if you don't plan those classes, sometimes um, some classes come in in pairs. So like, for example, one thing that added an extra year to my education was my, my counselor not informing me and me not doing my due diligence of figuring out what classes I needed to take. Um, I missed taking the first chemistry class that I had to take so I could transfer. So I had to wait a whole year before I could take it, as opposed to if I had taken it you know, when, when it was provided that year, then I would have been take, able to take the second one that goes along with it and I wouldn't have lost a year. So just making a plan of all of your classes of where you envision yourself wanting to go to school, um, micro goals, and then you'll end up making it to your macro goal. 
Um, everyone's timeline and everyone's journey is unique. Um, I think that's really important to like let that settle in because what my journey was isn't what someone else's journey was. And that's totally fine. It's okay. Um, I think it's beautiful when people have different journeys. I love like everyone who knows me, I love talking to people and getting to hear like, where did you come from and how did you get to where you are and like what motivates you? So um, don't, don't think that you're too old or don't think that because you don't know anybody who's a dentist, you won't be able to do it. I have nobody in my family who's a doctor or who's a dentist or who went to college. So again, if I could do it, you can do it. You just have to remember like, hey, my story is unique and that's totally okay. Um, and also know that it's not, it's not gonna be easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Um, but just stay motivated, make sure that you have a good team around you, whether that be your family, whether that be friends, whether that be mentors, um, if you're antisocial, like have something that's like your outlet. Like for me, sometimes I can be pretty antisocial and I love running. I love meditating. I love reading. I love being creative and coming up with different outside of the box ideas. And sometimes that takes me away from other people, but that's okay because that's what I need to recharge. Um, and that's it. Thank you guys for listening. I think now we're going to take questions, right? Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. We do have some questions. So uh, the first question we have is, how do you deal with the heavy course content in dental school? Is it much harder than undergrad? Um, how do you deal with it? Making a plan. <laughs> I think that's always the first step. And then kind of, um, it's totally different when you come in to dental school as opposed to being an undergrad. Because in undergrad, you kind of could choose your schedule. You could say, hey, I'm going to take all my classes Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, or whatever. I'm, I'm going to, you know, make my classes all in the morning because I want to do stuff at night. But in dental school, they tell you <laughs> when your classes are. And they're usually all day. Um, the other thing with dental school is that it's not just... Um, about didactics. It's not just about your, your coursework where you're learning science and all that stuff. It's also about your hand skills. So for at UOP, hi mom. <laughs> at UOP, the first day we, we um, was it the first or the second day that we were on campus, we were already drilling into teeth. So not only do you have the science component that you have to be amazing at because dentists are actually doctors, um, contrary to some people's beliefs, like we sedate people, we need to know about medical complications of the surgeries that we do. Um, but also we need to be very good with our hands. We need to be able to reconstruct um, teeth when they're diseased or they're broken. So they have to look really nice. So I think um, coming into it already kind of knowing like, hey, it's going to be a little more difficult. It's probably going to take you the first um, semester or quarter to figure out like, what's, what's my strategy? Like, how am I going to be successful? Um, and I think also picking, knowing how to pick the things that you need to focus on and the things that you don't have time to focus on. So for me, um, I was lucky that a lot of things came naturally so I could focus on other things. Um, and also not spending too much time on, on things that you've already mastered, because if you could improve in your hand skills, that's going to help you more than continuing to recite organic chemistry things that you need to know that you already kind of have down pat. Um, study groups, I think are really important. I regret so much not studying with people more. Um, while I was in dental school, I think I could have learned a lot quicker, a lot more, um, thought outside the box. So just kind of setting aside time to study with people um, and being prepared before you come into lecture. I know sometimes uh, professors don't give you the lecture beforehand, but usually it's the same one as last year's. So just ask an upperclassman, um, look at their PowerPoints, look at their notes. So that way you come into class already knowing like, what the topic is so you don't have to sit there and figure it out. I hope that answered the question. So as a follow-up to this question, how hard was it to transition to clinicals and were you able to improve in your manual dexterity skills? Um, I loved transitioning to clinicals. That was when I was like, yes, back to what I know best. Um, I had been a RDA for 
15 years at that point already. So my, I think where I thrive is being with patients and in that environment. Um, so I was totally ready for it. It was where I was excited to go every single day. Um, I know it actually took me by surprise that I, I did have to spend a little bit of extra time on my hand skills because it was, you know, you're, you're doing these perfect preparations that have certain angles that have to come out of it and have certain dimensions. And so I would come in on the weekends or um, my friends and I would stay super late until the guards kicked us out. Um, so it's, it's a matter of just making sure that you're practicing. Um, another thing that I wish I would have done more is not cared so much about, about making one perfect preparation, but doing it a whole bunch of times and doing it quicker so that I could see, hey, this is where I always screw up. Like, don't do that next time. And then you create muscle memory a lot quicker than if you're spending an hour, two hours on one prep as opposed to spending, you know, the same amount of time on 10 preps, like you'll be so much more efficient when you start seeing patients. Um, so I think that's one of the things I wish I would have focused more on um, to help my transition a little bit better. Uh, how do you deal with the high financial costs of dental school? I'm figuring that out. <laughs> um, I, I'm still figuring that out. I recently have become like pretty obsessed with um, learning about the business of dentistry. And like you said, like how, how am I gonna tackle these huge um, loans that I have? Um, I think one of the best ways is just to be your own, your own boss, your, have your own office. So that way you have the finances to pay everything back. Um, so just kind of making a plan also looking at like start learning now how all these loans are going to affect you later on because um i just i was i was one of those people as of recent where i just never opened those emails like i didn't want to know how much money i owed i didn't want to know the interest i didn't want to know how many loans i had um until last year during the pandemic i was really like nervous like how am i going to be able to do this so I think just educating yourself is really important. Um, living within your means. I racked up 30 grand in credit card debt, like just living and paying for things because my um, my loan money would run out, you know, a little too soon. And I, I didn't want to ask my parents for money. Um, so I ended up having to pay that back after I was a resident. So it was like something that was always looming during residency. I would see how much I'm paying for interest and I'm just on my credit card bills. And it's it's insane how much money you just throw away. So educating yourself, making sure that you're living within your means. Um, even now that I'm, I'm a, a, a pediatric dentist, like working, I, I still live like a resident. Like I, I kept my same apartment because it's rent controlled and because I have more goals for my future that require me to kind of live within my means now so that I could have more fun later. Um, sorry, I forgot the second part to that question. Uh, it was only one question. It was only about how do you deal with the high financial costs of dental school? So I hope, I hope that that helped. <laughs> And the second question, another question we have is, despite the failures, what kept you mentally strong and motivated? Um, I think just knowing that there's a higher purpose to what I'm doing. Um, it's not, this isn't just for me. Like this, is, this isn't just for my family. Like this is for my community as a whole. Like all, all Latinos who are out there, all people who dropped out of high school, or who went to community college or all women who are told like, hey, you kind of have to decide like, do you want a career? Do you want to stay at home? Or all people who are a little bit older maybe and are thinking of going back into a field like this. Um, I think having that at the forefront and just understanding that giving back is, is actually what I'm like meant to do on this earth. Like that totally keeps me motivated. My family totally kept me motivated. Um, my mom would come and bring me food and do my laundry and help me clean and hug me when I would cry. Um, yeah, I think those are 
those are the biggest things that kept me motivated. And just having a goal of knowing that I wanted to be a pediatric dentist, um, that kept me going through dental school because if I didn't make it in dental school, if I wasn't, you know, top one third or one half of my class, then I knew that I wasn't going to make it to the next step. So always having that on the background really helped me. Uh, what do you like the most about your field? I love, I love the families. I love like just having fun when I come to work. That's one really big thing for me is culture. I don't, um, I don't want it to feel like work because what we do every day is, is really exhausting. It's, it's backbending, it's tiring, um, but it's so stimulating and you can see your, you can create these lifelong relationships with the families and you can see that you're helping them. Um, that to me is like the most important. I give out my cell phone to pretty much all the families that I that I treat because um, I want them to know like, hey, if you need something, I'm here for you. And there's so many times where they just use my number to send me like, hey, here's a cute picture of Johnny that we took today. He was thinking of you or he wanted to show you what the tooth fairy brought. Um, so, so situations like that, like really just, just make pediatric dentistry the best. I think that's what I most enjoy is just the, the relationships you form. And how do you balance work and family life? Um, well, I live alone, so that makes it easy. Um, I'm a big believer in work hard, play hard. So my friends know, like if, if it's work time, like I'm probably not going to talk to you until tomorrow because I'm dead when I come home and, you know, I put everything I, I do into my work, but on my days off, I'm going to make sure that I enjoy them. I'm going to make sure that when I'm with my family, I'm as present as possible. Um, I'm, tr you know, after last year, I just realized how, how important life is and family. And so I'm trying to be more cognizant of that and just making sure that I enjoy every moment with every person that I'm able to have because you never know. Um, if you could go back to undergrad, what would you do differently? If I could go back to undergrad, ooh, I don't know that I would do anything differently. I would maybe enjoy my time more, but you know, there's only so much time in the day. Um, probably, I would probably like same thing, like maybe create more study groups. So that way I would, I would learn a lot faster than trying to do it all by myself. And do you work with any nurses or PAs? Um, I don't work with any nurses or PAs. Um, my sister is going to be a PA, but no, I don't, I don't work with them. I actually want to try and work, um, more with like lactation consultants um, or anyone who's like in the field that's pediatrics, but in different sectors. Um, Cause I feel like there's so much that we can learn if we kind of like work together to figure out, you know, why is this patient snoring or why is this little baby not latching on? Um, but no, I don't work with any nurses or PAs at the moment. Uh, were any of your science prereq for dental school taken when you were in community college? Um, yes, I actually took a lot in community college. Um, one thing you have to check though, some schools don't accept everything you take. So I had to retake physics, which was a nightmare. Physics was not my favorite thing. Um, so when I transferred to UCLA, I retook physics. Um, but most, most other um, not higher division classes. I think I finished at, at the community college. So the last question we have is, did you take your DAT more than once? I only took it once. Um, and like when I was saying I was struggling that last year I was at UCLA, um, I think I took the Kaplan course or I started it three times. And I just, I was so burnt out. I was so unmotivated. I just had so much going on that I just said, you know what, I'm gonna take a year off and just not think about this and be able to buckle down and only study for this test um, so that I can take it once and just be done with it. Uh, so that's what I did. But no, I only took it once. I almost 
thought about taking it twice after I got my score the first time, but I had a flight to catch to go to Europe. So I just said, you know what, I'll just apply with, with these scores and see what happens. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for joining us today and teaching us about this field. It was an amazing presentation. For those watching this, the link to the quiz will be posted on our link tree found in the Instagram bio and has also been posted in the chat box. Our Instagram ID is way underscore organizations, so please make sure to have a look at that as well. And within this week, we'll also be emailing your certificates. Thank you once again.